Is this blessing only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who are also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Be seated, and let's pray. Lord, we have your word before us this morning. It is timeless, and it is meaningful, and it's eternal. And so now we're going to sit under this word again for the second week in a row. We learned so much about Abraham's life and uh, how Abraham was declared or made right, which means he was now no longer an enemy. He was a friend of God. He was reconciled. He was saved, we might say, in the modern. And so now we're going to look in this text again. And God, I pray you would speak to me through these hearers and that you'd be glorified in the text meaningfully uh, imported to our hearts. In Christ's name, amen. You know, it's not a big secret that all of us, we're living in a time where the, where the individual reigns supreme. The individual reigns supreme. This individual does what he wants. Uh, this individual believes that his truths are his truths and her truths are her truths. This person believes that my preferences are alone mine and I can do what I want and so long as I'm doing me, you can do you. It's anything goes in the culture, isn't it? We can see that it's anything goes. Well, enter the gospel into this world where we see that everything is going and confusion can abound. Confusion can certainly abound. And I've been speaking for 32 weeks in Romans so far. 32 weeks. And over and over again, we are, we are looking at this reality of how is one made righteous before the Lord? How is one saved before the Lord? What is entailed? What is required? What is the consequent of being saved? What does this look like? We've learned that because we're all under wrath, that the only hope for us is the gospel of Jesus. There's no other hope. It's not a transplant. It's, it's not moving to the jungle. It's not moving into the hills of Kentucky where there's nobody. No, it, it is the gospel of Jesus. We've learned it's the only hope. Listen, good works can't save you. Where you live can't save you. Even what church you attend can't save you. No, it is the gospel of Jesus that saves you. And when that gospel saves us, that biblical gospel that biblically saves us, it demands something. And so in that way, faith is certainly the way we enter salvation, but it is not the way we continue salvation. I hope that resonated in your ears. So, so far in the text today in Romans chapter 4, we've looked at Abraham and his justification. What is Chapter 4, verse 2 says, this was the earlier in the text, a couple weeks ago, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God, the text says. That's in 4.2. We saw that David was equally and also justified, and we're thankful to see this, and that is in your text, which you can see, and his sins being forgiven in chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. This is David. Great news for Abraham. Better news even for David, but also good news for you and good news for me. So if that works for David, and if it works earlier for Abraham, then guess what, church? This idea of how we're saved works for you too, right? Yes, it works for you too. But is that it? Is it just that we're just saved and, and, and we've got our policy and we keep it in the safe and we, we refer to it when necessary? No, it's more than that. Which is why I, I title my sermon, The Hard Truth of Faith. The Hard Truth of Faith. Well, today what I want to do is I want to show you that while, while we are saved by faith alone, listen closely to me, you're not saved 
by faith that is alone. Let me say that again. While we are saved by faith alone, we are not saved by a faith that is alone. Let me be very, very clear to make sure you follow that. Now, I'm going to jump out of chapter 4, and I'm going to refer to it in a, again in a minute. And I want to take you to another passage of Scripture um, that is a, a, a reference to also this context in this person of Abraham. And some of you might be knowing where we're going to go. And my wife already kind of alluded to the book. And so turn with me in the same New Testament to the book of James. James. This is towards the end of your Bible. Uh, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. Uh, it is there packed in. And let's look at uh, chapter 2 because James is going to show us that we're not saved by, 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 by just faith alone. It's, it's not just that. Again, James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. This is written by a different biblical author. Let me read for you this text. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Let me, re let me rephrase. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warm, and be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is what, church? What does the, the Scripture say? It's dead. So this is the letter of James. And in the formation of the canon of the Scripture, uh, this book was included, but because it was included, later commentators, later uh, theologians, later churchmen had some struggle to reconcile how the book of James coordinated and fit inside of the holy canon because it seemed at first glance for some that James was contrary to Paul. Now, these were later reconciled, and of course, that's why you have it in your book, because it was canonized, and it was scriptural, and we made sense of it, and I'll, I'll get to that again in a moment. But let's look more deeply with this content of what James does in chapter 2, because now he's going to link over to the very same thing we saw in Abraham in the Old Testament. And so let's move ahead just briefly, and let's look, at picking up again, at verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and they shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Now pay attention here. Notice what he does here, which is what we've been studying with what Paul does in Romans in chapter 4. Notice, follow along closely. Verse 21. Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. Verse 24, notice you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Verse 25, and in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now, if you have been keen 
and have been studying and you've been copious in your note taking from chapter 4 in Romans, you might now be getting to be having to reconcile and try to assemble some logic in what Paul is saying from Holy Scripture and with what James is saying from Holy Scripture. And you have to try to harmonize and maybe try to reconcile them because at first glance, you might believe they are speaking at odds against each other and one is trying to overturn what the other has said. And that is not what the Scripture is doing. It is not at odds one author with another. It is not. Now again, it seems that they're fighting. Here's why it might seem that they are fighting. James 2.24 just said, look at the end again with me if you have your Bible open. James 2.24 tells us, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And so you scratch your, your veritable head on James 2.24, and then you also keep your, your finger in the text of Scripture, and you remember many weeks ago, chapter 3, verse 20. Here's Paul. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So you're thinking, what, make, what gives here? How does this jive, you might use the word. How do I make sense of this? Who's right? Some of us might want James to be right. Maybe the more, the more, the legalistic person here might want James to be right. Maybe the person who maybe has a more, a more feeble, maybe more simple, or maybe more, a more robust kind of understanding might say, well, I want, I want Paul to be right. And maybe some of you are hoping, well, I'm going to do half of one and half of the other and hope that they're, they're both right. I'm going to hedge my bets. That's a terrible way to work through our way through the Christian life, my friends. It's a terrible way. So who's right? They're both right. And so what has happened in the life of the church is many people, many people have become to some degree aware of their sin and the only way anyone can be aware of their sin is if they're aware of their badness. If they're aware of the mark of God, the, the goodness of God and what he requires. That's the only way anyone can ever be cognizant of their sin is to know that they are sinners. So then what happens is people become aware of this to some degree, at some extent. But then due to impoverished understandings of themselves, a, a, a short-sighted understanding of how good is God, an over-elevation of how good I am, anytime we try to bridge that difference, we come up with wrong views. And then what happens is people might even quote a scripture like 1 John 4. And this only lends to the confusion. And 1 John 4, 8 says, anyone who does not love God does not know God because God is love. Because God is love. My friends, if you begin to get off of the biblical track and, and you begin to embrace something you prefer and wish to be true versus what is actually true, if you prefer to want the benefits of Christ but not the demands of Christ, you will like 1 John 4 a lot. And you will especially like those couple verses that say God is love, but you probably haven't read all of 1 John. I would say you probably haven't read this chapter at all. See, the world gets confused over this idea of God is love, and especially those who falsely profess Jesus as their Lord and like to quote the idea that God is love. And you in the church here, maybe even in this church, you may even be committing the same error this morning. You're comfortable to repeat God is love all the while. Your lifestyle that maybe began by, in your idea of, in mind, faith alone, it has only ever been a faith alone with nothing else that attends it. Is this you? You have to answer this for yourself. This idea of God is love, it goes something like this. God loves me unconditionally and so I can do anything I want because God loves me and just the way I am. It's unconditional. God's loving character thus 
will cover all my accidents, all my faults, all my failures, all my mess-ups, so long as I'm just not as bad as I could be. This is the idea of God is love. Let me tell you what, friends, if this is your idea, this is not biblical salvation. It's not biblical salvation at all. This is an example of cheap grace that says, God loves me unconditionally, I can do whatever I want because grace has saved me. This is not the record of Scripture. That God would simply save us from Himself, pay the ultimate cost to save us from Himself. Remember, you're saved from God, not the devil. Let me say that again. You're saved from God, not from the devil. And so He will save us from Himself. He'll send His Son Jesus to die. He'll die a gruesome death. He will die for those who will, will, will then give him some kind of affection, some kind of trust, and it won't matter how they live. Does that even sound plausible? Does that even sound real? No, it's not that Christ saves us only with faith because he does save us when we come to him by faith. But our faith that we trust in him by faith alone is not ever a faith that is alone. And it's a terrible, terrible lie. This record of Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and verse 4 is giving you the reality of we are, friends, saved by faith alone in Jesus. And when God views us as lo lovable, he already says we're, un we were, we're ungodly. Well, then we must understand this idea of unconditional love does need some fleshing out, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. But let's keep moving forward. Here's the other thing that maybe well-meaning Christians do. In their evangelism, because they say how much God loves each other. Hey, God loves you. you. You should come to Jesus. You should trust in Jesus because God loves you. <laughs> the next thing that happens is we might even say some things in our evangelism like Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31, the world is being evangelized and Paul is going out and in the world and people will say, what must I do to be saved? And so Paul will answer and say, believe in the Lord Jesus. You'll be saved and everybody in your house. And as if just Paul's only response to answering the question or fleshing out the situation, like that's ever his only answer. That's not his only answer. Paul means much more than just believe and give mind assent because not James say that even the demons, what? Even the demons believe, but do they look to God for salvation? Of course not. See, it's, it's, it's more than, than just believing in the Lord Jesus and then living the way you want to live. This is the, what the Scripture is telling you. Well, of course, it's not just and only believe. It's more than that. Let me give you two errors very quickly that I see so far from what I've been talking about. Number one. Error number one. You maybe want to write this down. Error number one is that faith and grace requires nothing of me. Faith and grace requires nothing of me. This is a view that someone might have that believes that Jesus has come just to rescue them from hell, but how they live on earth doesn't really matter because faith and grace rescues me and requires nothing of me. Nothing. I can live any way I want to live. That's, that, that's, a, that's a pernicious lie. That's error number one. The second error is equally egregious, and it is, as you see on the screen, that Jesus is thankful I'm saved, but not changed. Jesus is thankful I'm saved, but not changed. Listen, when Jesus calls us, when Jesus effectually calls us, he doesn't call us to leave us alone. He calls us to change us. So Jesus is not satisfied with just you being saved. He's also desirous, and I use that word, he's also desiring that you be changed. That's the record of Scripture. So number one, as an error, faith and grace requires nothing of me. Number two, Jesus is thankful I'm saved, not changed. Not so, friends. If Jesus saves us biblically, biblically, we will be changed. This is the record of Scripture. Now let's take another look at this, unless we think that maybe Paul and, and, and James are just trying to beat up on us. Let's look again at another author who has a very, very, very strong word against us who think that all we have to do is get saved and then continue doing whatever it is that we want to do. Because I do you and you do you. No, I mean, I do me and you do you. No, that's not the case. John, you know, has also provided to us a word from Scripture. And let us look at this. 
Paul's like James, and James is like Jesus, and Jesus is like Paul, and none of them hold to cheap grace. Jesus doesn't hold to cheap grace. Paul doesn't hold to cheap grace. James doesn't hold to cheap grace. John, nobody in the scripture holds to cheap grace. No one. Let's go back to 1 John. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3, 4 through 8. It's on the screen. Maybe you have your Bible open. Let's look at this again. 1 John 3, 4 to 8. I'm going to read this slow. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him, this is what we're talking about Jesus, in him there is no sin. Six, no one who abides in him, in Jesus, no one who abides in Jesus keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Seven, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Eight, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. My friends, sin is not okay. Us believing that we can continue sinning any way we want to because the grace of God covers my sin, that is a short, non-biblical view of salvation. And yet so many even in the church, hold to this view, which is where the term the carnal Christian comes from. Leading carnal lives, yet calling themselves Christians. This is not what the Scripture says to us. Sin is not okay. And he's not done, John. Go on and look at verse 9. And again, look at verse 10. No one Born of God, and this is going to connect with something I'm going to say in just a minute. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. 10. By this, it is evident who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. My friends, where in the world did the idea of getting saved and surrendering one's life to Jesus made it acceptable to live any way one wanted to live? Where did that come from? It comes from selfishness. It comes from greed. It comes from us wanting what we want. It comes from an impoverished view of the entirety of Scripture. It comes from an idea that grace is cheap and that heaven would be a, a sore place unless... Jesus had me there with him, so he wants me there so badly. What a sad, impoverished view of salvation. No, being changed is a demand. It's a requirement. And, and we see it even in the text of 1 John. Now, again, let me say this. A true, believing Christian person, saved biblically the way the Scripture calls us, is a changed person. Look with me at the gospel according to John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And this will connect with later in 1 John. Look at John 3.3. 3. John 3.3 3 points to this newness, this changedness, if I, can, if I can say it that way. It points it very, very, very clearly. My pages are sticking together. I'm not sure why. John 3.3 3 says, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, there's the change requirement. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born five? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless 
That means it's a universal requirement. It's a, it's, a, it's a necessary condition. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's John 3. Look ahead in Romans. In Romans chapter 6, and we're going to get there too. Romans chapter 6 again, verse 4 to 6, is fighting this idea of cheap grace. Romans 6. We were buried Therefore, with him by baptism. This is a picture of the new, this is what Paul, Jesus is talking about in John 3. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we too might walk in the newness of life. We're raised new. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self this is pre-salvation. We know that our old self was crucified with him, put to death in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Let's look ahead at 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, we see here that this idea of newness, of changeness, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, notice the if. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So see, friends, Pastor Paul isn't just up here on a soapbox. I'm not just here trying to, to, to beat submission into you. I'm simply sharing with you what the Scripture says. Does not the Scripture say all that I'm saying? Yes, and I want you who are listening to my voice, you who are online as well, I want you to have true assurance that you are a true believer in Jesus. That's the effort and the reason why we preach the scripture, because I want you to have right assurance, not false assurance, because too many Christians also have false assurance. I don't want that for you. Jesus says, I've come so that you may know that you have eternal life. And some people who are calling themselves Christians, for them, it's nothing more than a moniker. It's nothing more than a term. But it has no truth. But Jesus has come so that we may know that we have. These things I have written. The scripture says so you will know. Again, one is reminding us of the scripture as meaning the one. The one scripture is reminding us that we are saved by grace alone in Jesus but our faith alone in Jesus is not a faith alone that in our life is alone. It has change. It has works. It has deeds. It has repentance. It has trust. It has affection. It has warmth. It has so many things. It's not just faith alone. Our actions are different. Leviticus in chapter 11, verse 44 says that we are to be holy. And be set apart. Again, be changed. Matthew 5.48 says that we are to be perfect. Now, can we be perfect? Do this with your head. No. No, we can't be perfect. But we're to aim for it. We're to want it. We're to shoot for it. We're to desire it. And when that Holy Spirit, when we get salvation, is in us, that's one reason John talks about not continuing to sin. Because the Holy Spirit is with us, in us, communicating, convicting us of sin and righteousness and judgment. And so we know when we've not done what God has called. We know and we hate it and we repent and we turn and we, again, return unto the Lord. Jesus doesn't say anywhere, keep on sinning. Paul doesn't say anywhere, keep on sinning. James doesn't say anywhere, keep on sinning. No authors in Scripture say, keep on sinning. It will go well with you in the land. No one says that. We're told to turn from our sin. Mortify our sin. Put to death the deeds of the flesh. See, faith alone is not faith that is alone. It is joined to work. It is joined to affection. It is joined to obedience. So here's two more errors. Error three is Jesus loves me just the way I am. Jesus loves me just the way I am. My friends, back to unconditional love. What unconditional love means is that Jesus loved you with an unconditional electing love. An unconditional 
sanctifying love. At its end and at its goal was sanctifying you. Drawing you, change you. That's the unconditional part. He didn't see anything in you. In other words, he saw no conditions in you to save you. That's what we mean by unconditional love when it's said rightly. Not we can live any way you want. That's the error. Jesus not, does not love us with the love that leaves us carnal and immoral. No, that's not Jesus loves me just the way I am. Not at all. Error number four. The law is no longer binding on me. Error number four is the law is no longer binding on me. Now what I mean by this is Jesus fulfilled the, the demands of the law, didn't he? All of them. The Ten Commandments. Even just the two, which summed them all up. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a desire or want or need to do them too. We are ca called to that. Because if Christ is in us, we want to do those things. We know it's for our benefit. We know it's for our good. So error number four is the law is no longer binding. No, the law is still binding on us. Jesus meets its demands, but we have a desire now for the first time as in a want and, and as an affection to do what we ought to do to please our Heavenly Father. My dear congregation, my dear friends listening to my, my voice, a Christian is a changed person. Let me say it again. A Christian is a changed person. He's not a perfect person. She's a changed person, not a perfect one, a changed one. Titus 2.11 and 13. Uh, Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Again, don't leave it there. Don't, don't, don't strike verse 12. Because again, verse 11 sounds wonderful. Except that verse 12 is attached. Which trains us to renounce ungodliness and unworldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for the blessed hope of our Savior Jesus. Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. This is another passage from Hebrews that is reminding us, we don't know who the author of Hebrews is, some people think it's Paul. It says, for if we go on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. See, we don't just willy-nilly continue sinning as it's great. No, we're to hate and despise our sin. In other words, it matters how you live. It matters how I live. It does. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You know, you know some of you are aware of, of Bonhoeffer. Um, Eric Metaxas does a great uh, work uh, on, on a book uh, writing about him. But Bonhoeffer was around the time of the Nazi regime. <clears throat> and Bonhoeffer was a believer in Jesus. And Bonhoeffer was really struggling with the idea of, of what he was seeing around the area of the idea of cheap grace. And as Hitler is, is, is doing all that he was doing to, to animate his, his vitriol, which would come out in, in, the, in, the, in the persecution of, of the Jewish people, to persecute them, to kill them, to destroy them, to annihilate the Jewish people. As this was fueling Hitler's passion, it was also fueling Bonhoeffer's passion to ask the question, how can this continue? And he saw the church around him as doing nothing. The Christian people as doing nothing in the face of great evil. And so here's what Bonhoeffer says. Quote, Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. It's baptism without discipline. It's communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. He goes on. Costly grace, in contrast, has a cost. This is biblical grace. It involves surrender, mortification, sanctification, and the carrying of the cross. Friends, it would be Bonhoeffer who decided that he would reconcile, that he would commit a sin of murder. He would commit a sin of murder himself in trying to assassinate Hitler. And he wrote a whole book on this called Ethics where he wrestles this through in his mind because he believed his sin was justified only for the sake and reason 
to stop someone like Hitler from propagating an endless cycle of hatred and murder and destruction. I'm pretty sure that if any of us are going to sin willingly, it's not for that kind of reason. See, it matters how you live. Again, can you be perfect? No. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. But what I'm aware of now is the more and more where I have short areas in my life where I sin, I I hate it. I I I turn from my sin. I repent. And I come back to the Lord Jesus saying, Lord, I I cast myself at your feet. Oh, unworthy unworthy servant that I am. And I come back to him. That's what a believer does. We come back to him, vowing to never want to repeat that sin again. Error number five. Here's, Here's two more before we get ready to close. My growth or maturity is irrelevant. No, it is relevant. If you are a believer in Jesus, you are to grow. It is not irrelevant. You are to mature. You are to go on from me, milk, to meat, the scripture says. You are to go on and move from the elementary teachings to the greater teachings. We are to mature if we are believers. It is not irrelevant. Error six. The other error that is happening a lot is this idea that Jesus is my Savior. Well, Jesus is my Savior only is what I, I append. This is also an error. What I mean by Jesus is my Savior only is you want Him as your Savior, but you don't want Him as your Lord. You want Jesus as your Savior. You want Jesus to save you from hell, but you don't want Him to be your Lord, which means that leads your actions. Again, a lot of us want Jesus as Savior. We don't want Him as Lord. And if we want Jesus as Savior and not as Lord, He will not be Savior at all. Let me say that again. If you want Jesus as Savior only and not as Lord, you do not get Him as Savior at all. This is the record of Scripture, which I've already shown you. In just a few verses, I I can spend all day with you. I hope you're getting a grasp of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. John is not at odds with James. James is not at odds with Paul. Paul is not at odds with John. Jesus is not at odds with the others. Let me say this to you. Because it seems like maybe you, I still answer the question, who's right, James or Paul, when they make a reference to Abraham? I said already, they're both right. And here's what you must know. And I've said this before, but I'm going to say it to you again because sometimes we just don't hear. We get tuned out. Paul in Romans chapter 4, and you want to write this in the margin of your Bible or in your notes, and do not lose track of this. Paul is talking in Romans chapter 4 about Abraham in chapter 12 to 15. Paul is referring to Abraham in chapter 12 to 15 of Genesis. James is referring to Abraham from chapter 15 to 22. That's the difference. They're both saying the exact same thing. Paul is saying, from all eternity past, God unconditionally elected and loved Abraham by rescuing him from Ur of the Chaldees when he did nothing. That was his unconditional love to elect him, to save Abraham. And then he was justified and made right. That's the faith alone part. James is saying, and then once that happened, Abraham just didn't sit on his hands, on his butt, and do nothing. He then began to live a life of obedience. And that's what James is talking about. So much that when he was asked to sacrifice his son, he took his son and laid him on the pyre, showing his obedient works. See, James is saying faith is not alone. Paul is saying your works don't save you. They're both saying the same thing. It's a coin with James on this side and Paul on this side. It's the same thing. My friends, I I don't want to sin. I've I've made some decisions in my life over the last, you know, couple months and I've made those decisions months before that 
where I, where I, where I make some very hard decisions. Where like, I, I, I've got to mortify. I've got to stop. I've got to not do this. I can't do that. I can't go here. I can't go there because I know my tendency. And I'll do whatever it takes. Are you willing to do whatever it takes? I want you to do whatever it takes, people. Because I want to, you to have the peace of the Lord and not the guilt that comes from sin. If you're smart and you are cognizant, you know that when you've chosen to sin, it doesn't feel good, does it? Right? Maybe for a moment it does when the excitement is there and then comes the pain and then comes the poison and then comes the sickness and then comes the guilt and then comes the shame. I've come and written that you may have joy so that you may know. We're called to grow. And 1 Thessalonians, and I'll close with this, if we come to Jesus Christ, we're called to be changed, we're called to grow. And we're called to mature. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 2 to 8, let me read that text for you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 to 8 says, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. And if you say, I don't know what the will of God is, I'm going to tell you right now. You'll never have to wonder. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That means growing more and more like Jesus. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit. Friends, this is, a, this is a stern word, but it is a holy scriptural word. And it's also a comforting word. If you will own it, it is a comforting word for you. It's a confirming word for you as well. Remaining in our sin is not the life that Christ has called us to. He came to give you a life and to give you a life abundant. He didn't just die to save us, but he died to change us, to lead us. Is he our Lord too? Remember, do you just want Jesus as Savior or do you want Him as Lord? Well, Matthew 7 may help you to finalize your answer. In Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And, and, and Matthew goes on. And how does Jesus close that section of Scripture? Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He would add that I never knew you. Oh, Romans chapter 1, back to Romans. Romans 1.16 says, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, amen, for everyone who believes, who believes in Jesus Christ, who puts their trust in Jesus Christ. Is that you today? If that's you, it will be marked by a life that is changed a mark that is on the path to Christ in all things, in the life of, in your home, in your thought life, in your actions, in your church, in your peace, in your work, everywhere. We're changed. We are peculiar people set apart for good works. This has been the word of God preached to the people of God where you may be. May you receive it as such. Let us pray.